Hi, I'm Kurt Dodi with Realm IQ. This is our podcast, Realm IQ Sessions, where we talk about everything AI with AI leaders from around the world. Today's guest is Richard Merritt, coming to us from the UK. Rich is a visionary and pioneering expert in voice technology and generative AI, boasting, bo boasting an impressive track record of innovative projects, creative strategies, and education pieces. Welcome, Rich. Please elaborate on your career and what you're doing with AI. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, so I've been mainly involved in conversational AI, uh, focusing, as you say, on voice technology. Uh, I started in voice technology in 2017. In a previous life, I was an educator, moved over to the tech world, and started with working with kind of Alexa and Google Assistant around the time that they first launched, really looking at the time to try and work out how this kind of new conversational technology could be used to alleviate loneliness in, in care homes and for people with kind of degenerative brain disorders like dementia and the such. Mm. So I was looking to try and find ways to try and really kind of bring that technology to help people in various different ways. Like created lots of experiments. I'm not kind of a medical expert. So I did lots of experiments, lots of kind of like different Alexa skills and Google actions for to just to kind of test out different theories around kind of stickiness. So trying to build habits with these technologies around kind of how to deliver complex instructions over just voice, how the kind of the multimodal experience works, that kind of thing. And really just kind of looked at trying ways to, to kind of get people more comfortable in there, in the environments that they find themselves in, in later life. Um, my career has expanded over quite, I know, I've got involved quite a lot over the years. I created a YouTube channel reviewing Alexa skills with my children. It was called Echo Dad, um, where mm. we got kind of real raw reactions from children because everyone at the time was saying, children can't use this technology. And I wanted to prove that they could. Um, so we did that. Uh, we had a meetup trying to uh, kind of educate kind of just the local community in Cambridge and around there to try and understand how this technology was working and update people just who are interested in it. And then I moved over to a more kind of strategy role and uh, kind of move, looking into how brands can really use this technology to, to kind of advance like engagement with their customers and, and kind of build their, build their brand base a bit more. And was fortunate enough to work on several high profile projects, including the Amazon Alexa themes where I used my, I'm going to call it, I'm going to use the word expertise in SSML, which is a very, very weird and very specific and very niche kind of thing that I love when I'm writing a book about. So SSML, for, for listeners that aren't aware, is speech synthesis markup language, essentially how to make robots sound a bit more human, um, and got to teach Alexa how to speak Na'vi, the language in Avatar, which was amazing fun. And then I moved more into the kind of generative AI space and looking more at how kind of the personas that I was working on with voice can be used in generative AI. And like, and that's where I, I kind of used uh, the book that I'm writing on SSML to take my persona away. And this was before custom GPTs and use it to kind of create a persona of me to then write another book called It's Good to Be Bad, which uh, is just about how kids, characters in kids' children's stories are always as bad as they seem. The giant in the Jack and the Beanstalk, for example, not a bad guy. He was being robbed by Jack. So, you know, how those kind of things work, but it writes in my style. And that's a lot of what I've been about over the, the last sort of eight, eight, nine years is about experimentation and working out how this technology can be used to kind of bolster what we've already got. Fantastic. Yeah, I just got off of a think tank call with a bunch of AI experts, which is fascinating. We were talking about legacy AI, and then that flashpoint when ChatGPT launched as being really the birth of Gen AI as a distinction, and then all the products that came after that, which are very different than Alexa and Siri, which have been around for years. And people don't realize the history of AI that it's actually been around for 50 years and, or the term, you know, was invented, certainly machine learning and, and all of, all of its implications. So it's fascinating that you were involved in, you know, some really high profile projects and, and uses and applications for that legacy AI. I, I come from, you know, creative background, user experience design, branding, and marketing. And I I do believe that voice is going to be the new interface, right? I mean, you, you must have a point of view on that, but do, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. You know, voice, it's, it's the first thing you ever learn. And it's also like thinking back to like the dementia stuff that I was kind of talking about a minute ago, but it's also the last thing you lose. 
So like voices, like it's, it's the thing that is almost like a constant throughout your life, like in terms of being able to interface with something or someone. And there's, it's just, it's a natural way. Like it doesn't take a lot of learning. You know, there's all sorts of kind of research out there about how like certainly older adults don't like to embrace new technology. However, with voice technology, the uptake was massive because there was no learning curve. They didn't have to learn how to swipe and what like the little cross meant and, right. you know, what the, the, the burger means to kind of get more settings and stuff. You just use your instincts and do it that way. And, you know, and thinking about children, like, like my kids in school don't learn about how to use a keyboard and mouse. Like that we kind of just take for granted that we can kind of use that because we've kind of grown up with that tech but they don't get instinctively taught how to use that. Now, there's an argument that parents should be doing that at home, but also like part of that is like, they're not going to need to in 15, 20 years time. They're going to be able to like voice, voice recognition is so much better than it was even at the kind of the advent of Siri and the advent of Alexa and certainly much better than it was with IVR. But like it's, so it's already come on leaps and bounds and the way that it communicates now, especially with that kind of, as you said, that flashpoint with Gen AI, there's there's now a lot more ways in which users can interact with voice and like can build out those experiences a lot more than you know for the last you know seven years it's been quite kind of structured we as designers have had to come up with the conversations and work out what people are going to say and kind of direct them in the right way and and use our knowledge of interactions to be able to kind of design that effectively yeah. now with gen ai we, you know there's an element of that that kind of can be left to the to the ai to come up with yeah um so that's a really interesting point and you know for me like someone that is really involved in kind of the the nuances around that kind of that conversation those edge cases and making it feel more relaxed and more engaging like how that works and how what's really interesting for me moving forward is how how ai is going to handle things like SSML. How is it, how is AI going to be able to make the the text that it is producing sound a way that is that is really kind of like pleasing on the ear? How is it going to be able to break up those sentences in a way that is not natural? We don't, you know, putting pauses in a sentence, it takes listening to that sentence to be able to do. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that's going to be trained and how that kind of the output of that ends up. And if there is then going to be need for people to kind of skill up on things like that, to be able to make those experiences a little bit more human. Yeah. I, I use Murph.ai quite a bit and, you know, some, some voices, you know, just don't work. And then you try the next and whether it's an Australian accent or a British accent, somehow, you know, that avatar gets it, you know, yeah. what you wanted to say or what you, how you wanted a certain word pronounced. So, it, you know, it's a matter of, you know, playing with these platforms to get the results you want. But at the same time, uh, it is learning, right? And, and so it can only get better, you know, back to your, you know, keyboard <laughs> comment, I remember taking typing class as a summer class many decades ago, <laughs> you know, when I was in seventh grade, I, I said, I, I want to learn typing over the summer as, as and be, get ahead of my, you know, fellow students in school. And, you know, who, who teaches typing now? It's like, said, yeah, they don't what, really what, what is, what is I'm looking at my keyboard. What is Q, Q, QWERTY UF, right? Right. It's like, yeah. yeah. Where, where do I put my fingers and how, how do kids know that these days? But you're right. Voice will certainly replace that. So I, I, I love your statement about it's the first thing you use and the last thing you, you, you use. Uh, but I will say for interface design, yes, you can uh, give an audible, right? Yeah. But then what's manifested, right? What is represented to you is the findings. There's still an interface there. So I, I think the uh, hopes and dreams of UX designers is not gone because Absolutely there's still a, a screen or a dimensionalized, you know, spatial computing or dimensionalized inter interface that people be re uh, reacting to based on uh, uh, an audible or, uh, you know, a prompt, uh, audio prompt to get the results you want. Uh, so, so it's just, it's an interesting and fascinating thing, but I definitely wanted to, Ask that, you know, as, as a 
you as a futurist, you know, where is this all going? Because I, I do talk with students and their and, and teachers and professors, you know, what is the future? It's like, what are we teaching kids in art school? You know, you know, yeah, about, not... because they're the ones solving problems of how, how to communicate, right? You know, graphic design, UX design and, and service design, you know, what, what is the future of that, those occupations? And I, I think it's those people with those types of brains are, are going to be the ones solving these, these problems, certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I saw um, I saw a talk not so long ago from uh, a guy called uh, Sol Albert, who is a professor at uh, Loughborough University in the UK, and he was kind of uh, he was describing AI as a prosthetic limb. So, for like, so you think about you know like when when a an, a para athlete gets a prosthetic limb, like it makes them a stronger athlete. It makes them a better athlete. It doesn't replace them. You can't just have the prosthetic limb running on its own. You have to have the rest of the athlete there with their knowledge and their brain and their abilities and the way that their their brains function to be able to actually produce the end result, which is a gold medal or whatever. Right, right, right. Um, and I think it's the same. I think the, the the analogy works quite well, certainly with kind of some of the creative and kind of educational pieces like it's it's a tool that can be used to really kind of bolster your arsenal like you know you, you mentioned that you know, where do where do creatives go I was having a conversation with someone the other day that was saying you know entry level developers are almost it's it doesn't necessarily need to be a role anymore because the gen ai can do that kind of entry level coding kind of stuff but but and I was also saying then that their brains are required, the way that their brains work are required to do like the next level up and to be able to analyze that code and to be able to come up with the prompts to, to put that code in in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, a lot of this is it's it's working out ways in which people can adapt and use this to to kind of to their advantage. Like there is no like, I can create a lovely looking image on mid journey for example but i have no artistic background and, and like an actual artist will tell me where that's flawed i uh, um you know the cover of the book i mentioned earlier that uh, i did that with with bing ai like the entire book is, is is ai generated apart from the introduction which which i wrote on an airplane because no better place to write than when you're trapped in a box but the you know I then spoke to some artists like later on, some artist friends. They were like, well, I would never have done it like that. I'd never have done it like this. You should have shifted this and that and moved it around. And it's their brains that, and the way that their artistic brains work that are still necessary in society as a whole. Thank you. This is a gripe of mine, <laughs> you know, because I come from classically trained uh, art school. I, I was an uh, illustrator for many years, then became a designer. And so there's this thing that I refer to as the aesthete, meaning you have it or you don't. If you have it, you go into art school and you learn how to how to how to how to use it, right? And it, you know, it it it. I call it uh, also, you know, be, being an art snob. You know, being qualified to actually say, you know, that kind of sucks. You know, mm. or or critique something. You know, have a critical eye. But it's based on that aesthete, which is, you know, Robert Henri called it the art spirit. It, it's about this this notion that there's there's a there's a soul there. You could call it a gift from God, but it, there is something there. And I and I think you know moving forward, it's it's those people with the aesthete that needs to drive not only the innovations that are happening in Gen AI, Gen AI but we need to get past the junk <laughs> that's being manifested because right now people are saying, look, ma, no hands. It's like, look, ma, I did a painting in mid journey and it's like, okay, but for what purpose? Mm -hmm. uh, so design with purpose, play with purpose, create art with purpose, but just to put it up on LinkedIn and say, Hey, I was playing around with, you know, Leonardo look what I made. And, and mm. it's like, okay, great. But there's some of us who are using these tools to empower us to do larger things like solve client problems, solve problems for ourselves and our own workflows, our own creative workflows. 
and 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 we're doing it quietly because a lot of it is not necessarily sexy right if mm -hmm. i'm using chat gpt to do uh persona development for uh, a brand that i'm working on well it's not really sexy right it's not as sexy as the flying rainbow pig in the neopunk cloud absolutely screen. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I'm using it. It's empowering me. It's like I'm able to do my work more effectively and more accurately and better. And so I'm just hoping that, you know, this this flood of playing superfluously will subside and re real creatives can, I don't know, somehow be celebrated a little more than everyone, you know, liking the flying rainbow pig. Uh, absolutely internet, and right? it it has to happen like it 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 will come that way and it will come full circle because at the moment it's all very kind of new and shiny and like like oh here i've just been sitting in my in my home office and now i can create this rainbow pick um so people are excited by that and you know i feel in a very similar way around kind of ssml like it's well, it's yeah. an architecture right it's like it's like it's like it's sculpting the the speech and sculpting the way that it the output and like there is nothing that like, AI will be able to assist with that, but there's an element of that kind of that skill and that kind of attention to detail that an AI is not always going to pick up because it takes years of experience and it takes kind of having sat and listened to, you know, for example, when I was teaching Alexa to speak Navi, taking every single syllable of a sound that Paul Frumer, the guy that invented the language, had like listed out for like how to say hello in RV and listening to every single syllable and making sure that every single sound was then replicated in some way. It takes that level of skill and that level of attention to detail, which our students obviously have as well with like, you know, having years of study that is what is going to produce a better quality kind of output. And it may be that they use it to help them, but it's, it's never, Right. Authentic. Bit, you know. I, I think this word comes up all the time, authentic. You know, how do you mm. make AI authentic? It's hard enough to just to be a human being and be authentic, right? You because you as a human being, you can sound insincere, right? In a yeah. response, right? Or callous or 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 phony, right? So how are you then training even with voice authenticity? So when you believe that a human is actually speaking to you. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the 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 goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that it's believable, it's authentic, and I trust it in a customer service environment. It's like I'm, you know, finally, oh, thank God, I'm finally talking with a human. It's like, actually, no, you're not. But yeah. okay. And then and then there's the whole ethical question about whether it should like say that you're not talking with a human right now. Like I remember mm, probably five years ago now when google duplex first was kind of announced and some like on, on stage we were trying to make a phone call with a hairdresser as i think it was to book an appointment and on the other end of the phone was it was google duplex that was doing the the kind of the the back and forth and making the appointment and the, and it sounded quite human at the time and the question then is do you at any point let them know that you're speaking to a robot or do you kind of stick with the pretense that you're speaking to another human being and making that appointment and that there's a whole ethical question around that which is an interesting one and you know with different I mean different legislation that's coming around the corner you know with the EU AI Act with you know whatever's going to happen in the states with whatever's happening in Japan Australia what the UK decides to do around kind of with written content being able to kind of say this is creative with generative ai and with imagery this is creative with generative ai how do you do that with a vocal experience without interrupting that experience right and that's an interesting i think that's an interesting question that is yeah no, and yeah what are the the guidelines i, I yeah. think there should always be a legal disclaimer right no, really. so <laughs> it gets you off the hook for representation but i you know, I think being authentic is the goal. I think having a sense of humor, that that's a very human thing. And so tell it me, is. what do you have, you know, <laughs> can these things have a sense of humor and be on the spot with some jolly response that's- Wow, this is it. Right? 
the sense of humor is also nuanced right like so what i find funny someone else might, might not find funny but the, and you know the ai can't judge the room you know one of the biggest things that i hated after kind of speaking on stages and like on conference circuits when the pandemic came along was then talking to people like like a conference like on like Zoom. we're talking <laughs> like we're talking now but but i mean i can see your face yeah which is great because i can see your reactions but when you're talking on a zoom to like 50 200 people and you can't see any of their responses and their reactions like did that joke land i don't know like am, am i am i still funny on zoom am i like i was funny on a stage i'm not funny on zoom what's this about yeah so like, i think there's there's an element of with, with ai like, like it can't judge the room so there's that element of it. Now, I mean, what I will say, I mean, it apparently it recognizes humor. So going back to the kind of the It's Good to Be Bad book that um, I co-wrote with ChatGPT, which I'm very clear about, I'm a co-writer. It's, you know, it took my SSML book, which has elements of humor involved in it. It has my, it's written with my personality. It's like, yeah. it's a factual book, but it's kind of, it's a bit fun because like we only live once, right? Yeah. Um, so and it, it you know when you get it to describe my persona it kind of it does say oh it's, you use kind of witty response you know witty and humorous responses to and like and pop culture references and all this sort of thing and it tries to then replicate that in a book now some of them are funny-ish like i probably wouldn't make some of those jokes right. but i think yeah it it some tries to become dad jokes right i mean i love a dad joke but yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've built a bit of a reputation on dad jokes yeah. but like yeah so it, it they are and then like they're not they're not clever jokes they're they are like you say they're kind of their dad jokes they're like obvious jokes to make um as opposed to kind of the the cleverer long-running format jokes that that tend to be a, need a bit more of a human interface yeah. So I guess humorists and comedians are, you know, not threatened at this point. I don't think so. Not yet. Unless they are one liner comics that just come up with like joke after joke after joke, trying yeah. to set the world record for for the most amount of jokes in 60 like, minutes. Take, take my wife, please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those kind of jokes. <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield. Okay. So big question. Where do you see this going in terms of not only voice and the things that you've been working on, but cultural implications, safety implications, cybersecurity implications. How do we how do we control that? How do we innovate for good? Do we focus on the good and not the bad? What do you, what's your philosophy around I mean, all that? I think we have to focus on the good and not the bad. There is always going to be a bad egg like someone is going to try and abuse the technology that's it's part of life there is always that kind of person but um there's a really interesting book by a guy called uh, Rutger Bergman called Humankind um like it's a history of happiness or something like that um and it's about how good people are and inherently humans are good and inherently we try and do good and 90% of the people that I talk to admittedly I'm not going to be talking to nefarious people too often um are trying to do good with the tech so i think i understand government's kind of nervousness around this mm -hmm. and i understand kind of the the general populace and the the mainstream media's nervousness around this because certainly in terms of newspapers and and article writing it can do quite a lot of that for people given the right source material and stuff so and they're the people that write the narrative at the end of the day so i understand that however i do think that having a knee-jerk reaction to something that has the potential to do good is a dangerous move and regulating too hard too quickly yeah. is also a dangerous move so i think there should be the ability to innovate people should be allowed to innovate and innovate in safe spaces as well but not put but allow that in and allow that innovation to happen. So one of the beautiful things about voice technology was Amazon and Google, Apple less so, because Apple was very ring fenced and very privacy focused and stuff. So let's leave Apple to one side. But Amazon and Google allowed de like bedroom developers to create a wealth of experiences and they provided the tools for them to do so. And that meant that 
a a lot of mistakes were made early by people just sat in in their offices in their basements whatever and it also meant the best practices were able to come out quicker so you think about like voice technology in terms of alexa it's been around for i think she's 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 just had her ninth birthday um eighth or ninth birthday ninth so like not been around for very long less than a decade and yet best practices are out there about how to design for voice technology in in a kind of that's in an environment that's in the home it's not like an ivr type experience so allowing people to have that freedom to be able to create and to be able to experiment and to innovate is really important and i think it's almost the responsibility of those big tech firms. So like your Amazons and your Googles again, but also your open AIs, your Facebooks, which I think actually Meta, sorry, which I think Meta is doing by open sourcing everything, allowing freedom for people to experiment and develop to help create, like understand what best practices should be around that. Yeah. Now, I, like I think that's, you know, having that ability for people to have those environments and call each other out on it. Like is also important. Like yeah, yeah. I, I think I think uh, the development community, even within a, a big tech organization, you know, open open AI didn't really release much for five years. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but they they were working all this shit out, right? And mm-hmm. you know, I just on this think tank I was just on, you know, one of the gentlemen had a tour of Neuralink and was talking about the experiments they're doing with monkeys and in planting mm-hmm. chips into their brains and getting so it is so we're not going to be replaced by robots evidently but monkeys mm-hmm. new right yeah. but yeah so so this experimentation and working out things happening in closed environments is research or you know r&d i think r&d can and should go on without regulation it's only when one you're going to be testing on humans and two mm-hmm when you go public with some release of a beta that regulation has to set in because they're going to say well did you consider these these things you know the implications of these things but i think in the spirit of innovation that that is not hindered by regulations until it goes public in some form yeah and right. and i think as well like as a community of of like ai kind of developers evangelists strategists like whatever you want to kind of put the umbrella term as there's a social responsibility there for companies to put their you know if a a company sees that another company is doing something that is like ethically dubious to kind of approach them in a friendly manner obviously but you know this isn't this is risky like we've got to think about the general rules because this is like this is moving so fast as well and that's I think something that's really interesting about this so I I did a thing at my my last company where I I did a thing called Newsday Tuesday so I did the new every every Tuesday or every other Tuesday I did a summary of like the news in in kind of conversational AI for the company so that everyone else could keep abreast of it it also meant that I got I wrote the newsletter and I kept abreast of everything as well which was always handy but everything moves so quickly that you know we, I mean, I mean, just look at OpenAI a couple of weeks ago. We, I mean, they had what four CEOs in the space of four days, and two of them were the same one. Like, you know, everything can move so so quick that it's it's very very difficult to keep up. And something can happen like that that you don't realize is that flash in the pan, and mm-hmm. you don't realize is that is going to be as groundbreaking as it is, or as as controversial as it could become. So being aware of everything and having a social responsibility to call people out if something is that i think is also important and at the end of the day makes us better humans as well yeah i think social responsibility through ai advocacy and evangelism because as we've seen with our country here across the pond (laughs) these government people are idiots when it comes to actually what they understand about the internet and social media. It's not media just your side technology. of the Atlantic. That works our side of the Atlantic okay, as well. Yeah, well, I, I'm i not really watching par- parliamentary sessions too much, although they are much more entertaining than our Congress, certainly. But you're right. I, I think there needs to be an empowered 
group of advocates that are advising governments and they're, you know, they are brought into the, you know, the White House here. I don't know how they picked the people, you know, I, I, when I see Time Magazine's cover of the most important people in AI, it's like, well, those aren't the people I'm talking to or, and that I follow. And so there's this, there's a weird populism that is influencing who influences government. And, you know, I'm not sure what the mechanisms are to enable deeper and better discussion other than doing podcasts like this. This is why I'm doing these types of shows. And I choose not to do, um, you know, YouTube videos showing me working on mid journey and look what I did. <laughs> there's so many better people at, at doing that. And there's, it's flooded. The market's flooded with that. But I think what's really important are, are these discussions like you and I are having and getting those out in the world and uh, exposing people to uh, the thought leaders uh, who are doing things, you know, <laughs> with the technology and have been in a while. I think you're a great example of that. And, you know, your point of view, uh, I, I think, is very important as a contributor to this larger discussion through a conversation like this oh i appreciate that but yeah i think you're right it is important to have those conversations and have those conversations out there because like you say there's there's lots of yeah there's lots of cheat sheets on twitter there's lots of x there's lots of like people doing videos on on how to's and, and and the way that all this can be done but these conversations that we're having now um are really important there used to be something uh in the voice world called the uh, open voice network that was a group of a lot of us that were in the, the working in the voice technology industry, working with with Alexa, working with Google, working with Siri, and we kind of came together and split off into splinter groups to work out, you know, some rules around that we should potentially put forward around ethics. And I was I was part of the education steering team to work out how voice tech could be used in in classrooms in the United States. And there was there was various other groups. There was a group around strategy. There was there was a few others, but it was all just, it was people that were working in that environment, having discussions, working out the what was right and what was wrong, like from almost like from an ethics point of view, and trying to hold some of the big companies to account if they were doing something that was was a little bit dubious. Mm -hmm. So having those types of groups as well is also really important as we move forward. And especially in a world that is so interconnected, I think if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that... It doesn't matter where in the world you are, we can find a way to convert. I mean, obviously, we're two sides of the Atlantic Ocean right now, but wherever in the world you are, we can find ways to converse and join up and use our brains for, for the better. And yeah. I think that's really important to get those viewpoints from, you know, from from the US, from the UK, from, you know, from Germany, Italy, Spain, but also from those kind of those outlying countries, sort of like the Latin American countries. How are they viewing it? Because it's also relevant to them. You know, we it's not it's not fair for the the Western, just the Western world of kind of middle-aged white men to come up with the rules. We should be kind of focusing on like everywhere else in the world as well and giving other people a say. And I think that's it's super important and it's possible now, which is the thing when it doesn't happen, which is irritating. Yeah. And God help us what's happening in China. <laughs> right. We yeah. just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, we're entering our end of our half an hour here. I wanted to give you an opportunity to plug anything, your new book or whatever, so that people know one, how to reach you and talk to you, but also how to buy things you're working on or yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, so I mean, if anyone wants to reach out, I mean, I am on X, Rich Merit 815, M-E-R-R-E-T-T, -E -T. no one ever spells it right, which is great fun in chops. <laughs> I'm also on LinkedIn, please feel free to reach out. I do have my, my book that is currently out, which is called It's Good to Be Bad. It is available on Amazon in all the best regions that you can actually upload it onto Amazon. So that's available there. And look out for Voice Magic, Harnessing the Power of SSML, which will be coming soon to all good retailers. Awesome. Well, listen, thanks, Rich. And thanks for tuning in, all you listeners and watchers, and catch more of our Realm IQ sessions on your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeart Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Please follow and subscribe. Uh, thanks, 
Rich, take care. Thank you, Kat. Thanks, everyone. You can now catch Realm IQ sessions on your favorite podcast channels, including Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and iHeart Podcasts. Or listen to the full sessions at kurtdoty.co forward slash Realm IQ. If your company is interested in reaching an audience of AI professionals and decision makers to promote your event or product, we do have sponsorship opportunities. If you enjoy these discussions on AI, please push that subscribe button below. I'll see you in the next video. Realm IQ. Book your corporate AI workshop today. Subscribe to our Media Slam newsletter and learn more about the intersection of design, content, and technology. KurtDoty.co Branding, Marketing, and Product Development.